Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Hey, Governor, Governor Tom. They, they called me up and said... They, they just said your host, Bruce Broussard. Broussard. Oh, no, 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 just a little prelim. I'm not oh. bisexual, so... Ready? Hey, man. Are we on? Oh, I'm sorry. Gee, folks, I'm sorry. I mean, I was, this, 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 well, this is, well, this is public, uh, <laughs> public <laughs> TV, if you will. Hey, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Thank you very much, folks. It's, it's been such a busy, busy week, as you note, uh, here in Oregon, uh, the whole issue with the governor's uh, situation, and, and there's all kinds of things on the air. But the bottom line is that we're going to go on because the fact of the matter is it's Oregon first. I mean, we're here sitting in the, in the largest district, if you will, in the state of Oregon, and I'm talking about education, the impact this is going to have in our education with this changeover with the governorship. Possibility, Keith Brown, uh, Secretary of State, is going to be maybe picking up the seat, and whatever. So, I th I just hey, let's just get right down to the meet and Mary. I got uh, Steve Buell on. Steve sits on the on the school board for Portland Public School. He was uh, he was a school board member once before. You can check him out on my YouTube, by the way. He's, he's he's been on the show a number of times, but he's been the guy that's basically been really of major concern with the issues in the Portland Public School, the largest school district in the state of Oregon. And so I've got Steve here today. Steve, how you doing? I'm good. Good, good. I want so what I wanted to do, Steve. I'd like Steve to just chat with us and give us give us his impression about the impact of this week may have in regards to this big changeover. Steve, what do you think? Well, I think uh, I'm optimistic about turning over the governor. Okay. You know, one of the things that's important to realize is that the governor isn't just the governor. In this case, she, okay. Kate Brown, right. now becomes also the superintendent of public instruction. Exactly. Which, and, and, Kitsopper had a lot of trouble with that, and I imagine Kate Brown will too, because it's two jobs. It's a huge job to to run the the school system. I mean, there's several hundred thousand kids involved in 197 districts, and you're really in charge of all that, mm -hmm. all of that. And so, it just Kitsopper was the first person to do that. He never really did the job. I, I've been at every pretty much. There's a couple. I missed a couple because I was in California a couple days, but almost at every. Oregon Educational Investment Board meeting that he chairs as the superintendent of public instruction. And he could never say, stay. he, he never one time stayed that I can remember for the uh, for the community input, the public mm -hmm. input at mm -hmm. the end. So we'd have the meeting, he's up and gone. Mm -hmm. So he's just, he's too busy to really do what needed to be done. Also, he, Kitsopper wasn't really very knowledgeable in education. He, mm -hmm. he had bought into uh, the new reform movement and the testing and the accountability and all the things that, and they pushed him too hard and too mm -hmm. fast. So what so about then, Susan Castillo? I remember she was superintendent one time, and then all of a sudden you would think it would have been a na natural well, kind of a deal to her to see sitting there uh, in the transition. What, uh, what do you think uh, about that? I don't know, but but <laughs> it would have been a, a, at least she was a full time person. Yeah, yeah. And and the, and the governor now Kate Brown's going to come in and do this real complicated transition and be right. the full time public and oh, wow. uh, uh, superintendent of public instruction doesn't work very good. But kind of let's just talk just a little bit about what Kitzhopper did and then what maybe right. the okay. challenges sure. are okay. for Cape Brown. Uh, the Kitsoppers, uh, Kitsopper took the Oregon Business Association, or the Business Plan for Oregon, mm -hmm. and the business people put forward a plan. It'd be kind of like if the teachers were running all the businesses right. in Oregon, right. but and that business people were basically had the plan to run all the schools in mm -hmm. Oregon. Mm -hmm. And so when... It, that plan, Kitsopper bought entirely, and so did the Oregon Educational Investment Board. And they, they, they took that plan and they sent it out to 16 different public meetings. Hmm. Eight first and then eight later. The first eight, people said, no, this isn't a very good plan. Mm -hmm. And the last eight, they said, this plan stinks. Nobody supported hmm. it. In the eight meetings, I think maybe five people supported it. Hmm. And so that plan, and then, but Kitsopper... And uh, OEIB took that plan, and it became the, the educational plan for the state of Oregon, even though no one wanted it, and the business community likes it because people are making a lot of money. And so we've done all this testing and accountability, mm -hmm. which has kind of irritated the teaching the teaching profession people, whether they be the school board association or the 
the administrator, the COSA, uh, the OEA, and the, the PTA. They're all kind of irritated, but no, everybody was afraid to speak out, really. They just wouldn't stand up and tick its opera. Mm -hmm. In fact, at the last OEA, OEIB meeting that I was at, the Hannah Vandering, who's the head of the OEA, said, you know, we got 44, I just talked to a lot of, a number of teachers, and we had in one classroom uh, in kindergarten 44 kids. That's not really acceptable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Kitsopper slapped her down, literally slapped really? her down, just turned and said, well, this isn't acceptable that we have all this and these, these problems with the homeless kids, and it's not acceptable. There was no working together hmm. with the people who are, the educators and the professional educators in Oregon, and particularly those associations that I just mentioned, there's just no working together. There was this this huge split, mm -hmm. and so what what took place kind of is Kitzhopper took this idea that really where you wanted to spend your money wasn't in the schools per se, the K-12 schools, it was outside of the schools, and he used this analogy, it was kind of a, and it's kind of a crazy analogy if you think mm -hmm. about it, his analogy was like in the healthcare, in healthcare, you don't want to spend all your money in hospitals, you want to spend your money on preventive care. Right, right, right. Did he do that? And, you and, think? and well, I don't know in the healthcare because yeah, I'm okay. not, I'll that's not my field, right, but, right, 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 but right. so in education it became this, right, you right. want to spend your money in early childhood ahead of kindergarten in and you want to spend a huge amount of money there not in what he called the hospitals basically is the k-12 okay but what he messed up on and he started spending money there i'll tell you how much he spent in a minute but what he messed up on is the schools aren't the hospitals they're the part of the preventative mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. the hospitals are the the uh, prison system, the unemployed, the the homeless, Ugh, the, uh, the those that's where that's what the ho that's the final mm -hmm. result, mm -hmm. and he couldn't he never saw that, and neither has uh, Dr. Uh, Nancy Golden, who's uh, the, who's really the CEO of the OEIB now. She she uses the same analogy, and the analogy is screwy. But what that what uh, what that caused to happen was they took. Last year, the OEIB budget was about $125 million that they wanted to spend on these projects out in various different school districts or in various different community organizations. And so they spent, eventually the legislature let them spend $75 million. Well, th this year when they came in with those same things, all outside of the K-12, they had $650 million. What? Six hundred and fifty million dollars of the K-12 money spent outside of the K-12 system, basically, and the idea is we give you these pro we have these programs, and then if they're successful outside of the system, then we scale them up. Well, the guy last week at a House bill where they're talking about whether or not to keep the Oregon Educational Investment Board, the COSA lobbyist pointed out that. You can't scale up that much money. Hmm. How, how do you take $650 million and scale it up? I mean, it would take billions of dollars to hmm. scale it up all over. But if you look at these carefully, not all, but a large number of a, a large amount of that money was going out to friends of the governor, to his hmm. political allies. So, hmm. I mean, I'd love to see uh, uh, a really good newspaper go into that, a good mm -hmm. newspaper mm -hmm. reporter, but go, what, what, into, go what, into that and, and, and look at that. So so what, I'm hoping that will shift, Cape, in comes Cape Brown, yeah, maybe but, some but of these are, things are will they, shift. Aren't they the watchdogs supposed to be, either the treasurer's office or if not that, the secretary of state's office from the standpoint of auditing? I mean, what comes to mind right off the bat with, with reference to here in Portland, in the largest school district in the state, they were always talking about achievement gap. I mean, everybody keeps regurgitating re over and over and over and over, and uh, what uh, was it the treasurer of the job, or, or did the maybe the secretary of state come in and do something like that? Well, the secretary of state did come in with an audit. For what? An audit for the testing in Oregon, kind of. But Steve, how long have we been doing that? Uh, well, her audit. Steve, her audit. Give me her, a break. You're, you're smiling. I tell how long, you, Steve? her audit result. I mean, one of the audit Steve? results was that we have an achievement gap. We have. You gotta no, be kidding. Yeah, between black. 
and children and and white children Kate between lives Latino in this area. children. She and lives in your district. She well, she lives in in the Portland Public uh, School I don't know. Arena. Is, What's is the she? deal? I don't know. Yeah, you talk uh, with her? No, no, she's going to be way too busy to talk. I think. Well, what about now? Anybody? Wow. Well, I'm hoping that eventually. I'm hoping that she will eventually. Now that she is the state superintendent of public instruction, that they, she will bring in. Disparate groups. But governor Kissel, because he's still governor right now until Another Wednesday. Couple, right? yeah, until Wednesday. But governor, Wednesday he has a plan. Now. He has a plan about it. He has a board and all this other in reference to education. Is she going to just assume that, you think? And well, should she? See, I don't know enough about her to know how that's going to come out. But like I say, I. When She's she not been there. Up, who's she going to select to be the, the lead person? Who's she gonna, is she going to just keep the same people in the government? Should in, in the governor's office, she's going to be on top of stuff, isn't she? I mean, if you she think about it, to be on she's going to know people and she's going to... But in the in the school system, now that she's state superintendent of public instruction, is she going to be on top of it? Is she gonna, has she sat down? Does she have enough... She has no under, background. She's does no, she, she have no enough... Background. Is she going to bring Susan kid, Castile back over, maybe? Kid Sopper had, no ba- had a worse background. What about Susan probably. Castile? Bring her back, maybe? Yeah, bring her back, yeah. yeah I, I mean, you know, know, she has background. Yeah. She, she was elected, what, the two terms, right? Well, right? they have Rob Saxton, who was the... Who was the uh, upset, yeah. superintendent of Tualatin and Tiger Tualatin yeah. School District, yeah, okay. which, by the way, got a big grant from the State Department uh, out into Tiger and Tualatin, what? one of the big grants that they're going to try and scale up for what the RPI stuff. I mean, you sit on we the board, the school that. board. You sit on the we school board. We get grants, I think. I got I you. Know, we, we got, got, an, few, occasional, we got, we got an occasional grant. We got some stuff. Well, but we've got them. a few more minutes here now, but the bottom line is that well, what's happening with the Portland Public Schools now? I mean, the, the impact that will have in regards to this, this new governorship thing. Are you going to get more bennies now? No, but I think that I think maybe there'll be a little retraction in the Oregon Department of Education on some of the things that they're pushing on. Some of the stupidity, for instance, we had uh, where they we had the achievement compacts. That was kind of interesting that they did the achievement compacts, where you're supposed to predict where your kids are in the testing coming up. In other words, if this year they tested at such and such level, then you're supposed to predict where they will be, how many kids will go up and pass the next year and so forth. Well, they changed the tests. Down it. This is how crazy it gets. They changed the test. We're now going to do the, the Smarter Balance test, which is nobody's ever done. We've never done before. But they still asked you to predict What's going to take place? We tried in the school district, aren't we? Because we have a or a, kind of a, a group that deals with achievement compact and had some really bright teachers on it. And the teacher said, "Can't predict this. How can you possibly Jesus predict this? Man. It's impossible to predict it. How can you predict it? No one's taken this test in Oregon ever before. So how can we predict the gains or losses? And the test is designed to fail." Probably sixty to seventy percent of the kids. It's designed to fail. Designed to fail. It's designed to fail that because if you fail that, then you have the reform movement, the corporate reform guys who are selling you these tests. Now, if you fail, and they continue to sell you the test, but they also can continue to sell you all the surrounding things, the textbooks, the the consultants, and all the other things, and make millions and millions but and the, millions of dollars on the design of this test, which is designed to. 70% of the kids to fail as designed. No teacher with any good sense would ever give a test in their classroom that's 70 or 60 or 70% of the people. But you guys are And they know in, that. The Oregon Department yeah, of Education okay. knows this. Yeah, but, but you still, you guys are still here in the Portland metropolitan area. You're still the, the highest failure rates among minorities, i.e. African Americans. Well, they have high ones that are not the highest, I mean, but they I mean, have high, high ones, yeah. What do you mean? As far as African Americans? We have high ones. We have high ones. In the sure. state of Oregon, you say we, that's... Oh, I don't know. The state community? of Oregon, I think you're talking... No, you know, no, yeah, no I'm talking about the state of Oregon. Yeah, it's pretty... It's pretty. It's high. It's high. It's okay, very it's high. high. It's very, very high. high. Very high. Okay. Now, so well, now we got. I'm Carolyn working on Smith. that, by the way, but they won't let me do it. But go ahead. I mean, I, I don't want to. I don't want to throw out a cheap shot or anything of that nature. But the fact of the matter is, you got Carolyn sure Smith. Sure, show you can throw well, out. Well, you got Carolyn shots. Smith, who, who happens to be gay, and you, she happens to be gay, and now we're talking about uh, bisexual. Well, but I, I don't want to get caught up in that deal. I don't want to. Do, I, but I the would fact hope that not. Matter, I would hope but, not. But my bottom, it, no, my bottom line is very simple. If, if that is the case, maybe you'll get more money. Uh, what for a case for what more money? Okay, okay. Well, maybe because now she's going to superintend no, the schools. I don't think there's a connection there. There's no connection for no. money. I'm talking about the money. I'm no. talking about. I'm, I'm talking about no. addressing this issue of failures 
here in the largest school district for how many years? How many years have we been talking about this, this issue? Long time. Long time. Steve, you were on yeah. the board when? when? When were you on the board? Wait, how, how long? 1979 to 83. 1979 to 83. We're what year are we now? What are we here now? What are we talking yeah, about? Right. 2001? 2015. 2015. Well, 2030? I mean, what? Yeah, right. Are we going yeah. to do something by 2030? Thirty, Steve. No, we got a very serious issue. I mean, the other issue that you have been talking to me about that we've been want, we were going to do some things on the show in regards to Volk Ed. Where are we on that issue? Yeah, it's, it's slow. We're going slow. It's insulting. I, I'm Outside hoping of this area. I'm hoping that what is the, going I'm on? hoping that when it's turn over the turn over the school board in this next election, you got a guy by the name of Paul Anthony who's a big Volk Ed guy. You got Curler, who's a good voc ed guy. You got me, who cares about that, the CTE, they call it now, and the STEM programs. And that we get that and get a little help that we can actually do some things that make sense. It's the same with, like, increasing the reading teachers and getting the librarians back. Teaching children to read is really our our major thing and we should be doing a uh, we should be doing that in a little different way and this might be helpful the governor turning over might be helpful in us being able to do that there's a new uh, well, governor, the new governor you said that's going to happen helpful. Me, no, you know, no, no. I'm going to say I'm, she might be helpful. Well, the governor helping. right now, he could do something now, right? Well, he's got until Wednesday. Three more days. He's got, he's got until That's Wednesday, not, three more days. He thinks, he's, he thinks his program was the, is the right program. Maybe because of the program, he might, he might uh, decide not to, uh, to give up his seat. He might just stick around for another uh, maybe five or six months. You think that uh, no, I don't would think that be a better that. benefit? It's You're it's smiling. Already, it's already we'll, done. We'll, we'll he's done keep no, he's not done. He, no, he said, hey, he changed his mind once before. He could change it again before Wednesday. I mean, we invite him to, hey, why not? I mean, I, I can understand this issue about the girlfriend, first lady I think thing, he's already, but that's he not already did his resignation letter, so I think no, he, no, he signs Wednesday. He hasn't signed the contract yet, Steve. I don't know. We got to keep him, right? Uh -huh. Okay, okay, you understand? Well, I guess the one last point, and then we're gonna just going to take a short, a real quick, short break here. What about you guys gave her an increase in the salary? She went from what to what? Carol Smith. How much? She I didn't from, vote for that. It was 28% increase. 20, how much is she getting now? I don't know the exact figure. It's up in the it's up in the middle and uh, two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand dollars more than that. Two hundred or more than that. Two hundred. And we got the highest failure doctor. rate in the state of Oregon in the school district. Well, no that. voc ed. I mean, we I can go on and on and on. well. Okay, Steve. We do have some voc ed. You got what? Some. Some CTE. I me, mean, her? You're gonna, you're gonna no, put her we have kid? some. Oh, I thought you were going to put her in both kids. And there's some remember. couple programs. I'm all, pretty I'm good. All, I'm all messed up. You got to get to the right place. The right, well, I, it, it's, it, you're right, the right place, okay? No, no. Steve, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for doing the good work, by the way. I mean, without you on the board, we wouldn't be able to talk to these issues. I can't get her to come over here and talk to the people, okay? And some of the other board members, you got your, you got your new chair on your, on your page. I mean, I've been trying to get in touch with them. Well, uh, you had. Uh, Paul Anthony was running for the school board. Well, a really a good on. guy. He was on before. Yeah, right, 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 yeah, right. And, and he was on with you and I, complained yeah, that he right. didn't get a word in edgewise, that's right, I think. That's right, that's right. Well, uh, which is probably true. We'll, we'll bring him on. We'll bring him back on. I mean, he, he, we're yeah, training. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. It's good. And they got and they got three or four or five. And we're going to we're gonna come on. I'm going to come back and talk about the elections. Sounds great. Later on. That sounds great. Uh, which we've sounds talked great. about. And so that sounds good. That sounds great. Susan Castile, okay. hey, put your put put your put your voting seat on. You may, you may be able to come back on this board. Maybe Kate, Kate. Kate, Kate worked for her very good. Maybe she might get um, get Susan to come back on the board, this new board that she's going to have, and let, let her take because she didn't. Kate take didn't have range. any background. Yeah, she didn't have any background right now, even from an interim standpoint. Got me? Yeah, but I honestly think that what will happen is that there will be a shift back to listening to those education organizations and actually allowing them maybe to actually say what they really think. Kit's opera wouldn't really. Listen, to Kate, that. Kate, here's the guy. Appoint him chair of that, that, that board down the state. I, I hate to see him leaving from here, from here, from Portland to the, to Salem, but he's the guy. That's who you need. Kate Brown. All right, Steve Buell, remember that name. Okay, fine. Steve, thank you very much, buddy. We're going to take a short break, folks, and we're going to get back. But, Steve, you got to come back on. I'll be back. Please. Okay. Kate, you hear that? Put him on that board. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> okay, Kate, hold on for a second. Okay. We'll take a short break, folks. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Look like we're back on. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host here. I mean, like I said, folks, we got some exciting times right now. And right in front, we got to get to the table. I mean, with this mix-up of this change over the, the governor from one governor to another, I mean, everybody's getting to the table, changing seats, things in hand. What's going to happen to um, uh, communities of color, if you will? And so that's what we're talking about. And that's what we're going to be talking about this particular round. And we just happen to have the, uh, uh, let's see, let's see, uh, let's see, Reverend Al Sharpton, is going to be in Portland. Uh, what date was that? No, he's not <laughs> going to be in Portland. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for right now. We just happen. We happen to have now right up front with an association with the National Action Network. Okay, mm -hmm. and we've got this young lady who's here on the day, and and that's her. Her name is. Uh, let's see. How about Glendora? Glendora. Glendora. Glendora Claybrooks. Glendora. Claybrooks. 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 Glendora. I'll get there. Glendora. You know, I'll get there. One of these. I'll get there. But no, it's really exciting. You know, the fact of the matter is, he's here. You know, Al is a is a very prominent figure. And, yes. And uh, that listened to, whether it be on radio, on TV. I mean, he's out there. Right. And in all due yes. respect, and when he touches an issue. I mean, people respond to it. Exactly. And as you can see, when I had this show just a minute ago, we got a problem here in one of the largest, largest, if you will, school districts in the state of Oregon. And people of color are, are the highest failure rates in this area. Yes. I mean, we're creating young folk. We don't have no voc ed, if you will, to either give these folks options, if you will, to learn other skills. Right. You know, there are many opportunities, if you will, in the in the labor market, all that other good stuff. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we're going to get into you, but I want to welcome you to Portland. Oh, thank okay? you. Okay, and I know my friend will, too. Oh yeah, you know, definitely. Greg, Greg Benton is going to definitely do that with him too. He's a he's an activist in his own right, but he's got a lot of history and a lot of background. And I work very closely with Greg. Okay, but at the same time, what we're going to do? We're going to talk about another issue, and we want you to listen okay. to us. You got me? And at yes. the same time, we want to promote what you're doing and ask you a few questions in terms of what you do. But we want you to give you the the, the lay of the land, and then at the end of the show, we're going to kind of get spend some time with you in terms of how we can get you involved in the process. Okay. okay? All right. Good. Welcome aboard. Thank you. All right, man. Happy to be here. Greg, how you doing, buddy? Well, uh, hanging in there, Bruce. Hanging good. in there. Well, you know, good. there's an issue that I know we've been following. I've been right there, and we're talking yes, about sir. the health issue side. Right. Uh, in most cases, you've always been the guy that's been, i.e., taking the lead to respond to some of the issues and health issues. That's but correct. all of a sudden, you got involved in the health issue aspect of it. Right. And then, uh, and I want you to share this with the public in terms of how do you get into the issue. All of a sudden, you now are a victim. Victim. So let's talk about this. Let's go back to square one, how you got into the victim aspect of it, and, and go through the process in terms of whether or not people responded to what your issues were about. Well, Hold basically on. we're talking about the uh, issue of hospital dumping. Okay. And uh, What does the, that mean? Well, that's when you go to the hospital and you have a severe illness and the hospital looks at you and they say, you're, 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 we're not going to treat you. For whatever reason they have, we're not going to treat you because either you're poor, you don't have the right kind of insurance, or we just don't like the way you look. And it could have been any of the above. Or medical incompetence, where they didn't actually understand what the medical condition was. Hmm. They perceived it as something different. Well, just go back one minute. The ER room, that, that's the, from a lay standpoint. That's the emergency, emergency room. room, right? That's kind of, because you know you took me down there once. Yes, sir. And I was there, and I saw all these people just sitting around and, you know, I mean, hurting for hours, and, for hours and hours. And I, I mean, in the middle of the night, and this, that, and the other. And, but the fact of me, there's supposed to be a service for those kinds of folks. So go ahead, continue on. I just want to make well, sure. Well, we're talking about the violation, and what we call the Imala. I always say it wrong. The Imala. The Imala law. E M A L A. She knows as much about the Imala law. Oh, good, good. Imala law as I do. And what it is is that it's a federal law that is that when a person goes to the hospital, they're supposed to give a competent evaluation by a competent official, um, um, a physician. Okay. And then they're supposed to stabilize you and keep you there. Until you are stable, whether okay. you have insurance or money or not, that's the privilege they get when they get an emergency room. Not all hospitals have emergency rooms. Hmm. That is their responsibility in the federal charge. But what we've had is these hospitals, like Emanuel Hospital, University of Oregon, as well as uh, Providence, they all do the same thing. There's all these hospitals for fee, mm -hmm. these commercial hospitals, will find that if a person does not have a, 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 a insurance policy or, or a, a protection, to cover what they consider is adequate or has a history of coming into the hospital and they're not comfortable with that person, they basically evict them out of the hospital, whether they're well or not. And in my case, they did it while I was in the middle of a health crisis. And at the time, they called the police. And this is the real insidious part yeah, is the okay. police come in and help the hospital violate the federal law. How's that? Well, first off, like I said, you're supposed to be stabilized before you're uh, supposed to be stabilized before they release you. And the federal law says if they don't do that, then they're in violation of the federal law. 
The police, call, they call the police. First, they have the security guards put their hands on you, violate you, put you out of the hospital physically if they have to. They'll write now, did you. Did this happen to you? I mean, this, this, this happened this, to me okay. twice, but okay. this happened specifically at Emanuel Hospital. Emanuel Hospital, here in Portland, Oregon. Here in Portland, Oregon. Okay, and what was that process? Okay, okay. You, you, went to the, you went to the desk, right? Yeah, I went, no, I didn't go to the desk. I came in an ambulance. You came in an ambulance? I was in, I was in such a dire strait, I came in an ambulance. I was okay. unable to speak, walk, barely talk. Mm -hmm. And because I was able, unable to speak, walk, or barely talk, and the way I was talking, right. not, not like I am right now, I sound okay. almost as if I was drunk. I wasn't drunk. Mm -hmm. I had a, a, a suffering from a traumatic brain injury. Okay. Suffering from other uh, brain issues that was, uh, as you see, like right when I'm speaking, I have to mm -hmm. slow it down. Mm -hmm. When you have these type of injuries, just like our veterans coming back from the right. war, they CSD, sometimes have yep. uh, yeah, TBIs, yep. traumatic brain injuries, they have seizures. Right. So it's a case of seizures. Mm -hmm. And they see a seizure and they don't quite treat it in the proper way. Mm -hmm. So by the time my friends, as I said, I was brought in the hospital by ambulance, ambulance people and saw they treated you? Yeah, they didn't treat me. They basically left me there on the gurney. Says, oh, uh, because of certain actions that, oh, you're not having a seizure. So at the time, I'm having seizures, you know, you're, you're disorientated. You can't, can't see, can't talk, can't walk. They decided to put me out of the hospital and release me. But they didn't release Wait a minute, me. from the gurney? I mean, they didn't take you into the, and, and try to deal with some of the issues that you have? Very little. So, so, so then what happens? Well, okay, they... They, they uh, told me I had to leave the hospital. They discharged me. And it was in the middle of the night, maybe two or three in the morning. And I basically I needed to make a phone call to call an ambulance. Well, they wouldn't call it for me. I didn't have a phone book to call an uh, no, I mean a uh, cab or anything like that or call anybody. I didn't have any numbers or anything. And because of the way that uh, I guess they didn't want to make the calls for me, they put me in a wheelchair wheeled me out of the hospital, but not to the side on Vancouver where you can catch a... Eddie Manuel Hospital. Okay, Eddie well, there's a bus there. Right? Yeah, okay. they, to the back side of the hospital. The back side of the hospital. Called the police, uh, security police, picked me up out of the wheelchair. While I'm in, uh, a, I was in a, a medical gown. I had tubes hanging out my body. Wait, wait a minute. Come on, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Come I had a major wait. operation as really? well. Yeah, I had a major operation. I had tubes with drain, flues hanging out my body. They picked me up, body slammed me, face forward, on top of the uh, surgical injuries. Okay. Slammed my head into the ground three times. Mm -hmm. And then they reeled me out. So, oh my God, look at him. He's injured and sick, or, or, or we didn't realize. You know, of course they did. The police knew what they saw. I was just sitting. Now, you were awake at that point in time. No, nah, no. Nah, I was pretty much uh, pretty dis disorientated from the get go. I was never totally lucid. Did he get any medication during that time? No, did they take a shot or anything? No, they didn't give me anything. Uh, so basically, they slammed me in the heat. Like I said, they body slammed me, slammed my head into the ground. Uh, then uh, asked me if I wanted to come back in the hospital. I told them to call me an ambulance. They took me to another hospital where I spent 10 days at Providence recuperating. They went from there to, to Providence. Right. Now, this was four days after I already had a major operation at Providence. That's part of the reason I was there. I was having complications from the operation and I was having seizures. Hmm. And I found this happening. Uh, on a continuous basis with several people as uh, one gentleman we were trying to bring on the show he had been evicted 16 times out of the hospital. Wait a minute, let's make clear. Okay, you, you now you're the Emanuel, uh, they didn't service you and then all of a sudden they're, they're taking you out now in a wheelchair. Yes. Okay, and then all of a sudden you get slammed down, et cetera, et cetera. And then they call for the ambulance and then the ambulance, ambulance took you to Providence at that point in time, right? Yes, sir. Now you're at Providence. Yeah. Now what happened to Providence? Uh, I stayed there for 10 days. They treated me. For 10 me. days. They yeah. did treat you? Yeah. Okay. Same hospital where I had the operations four days before. Okay. They Same doctors who treated me and they looked okay. at me and said, oh my God, the difference is night and day. Well, mm -hmm. of course, I had been abused at Emanuel Hospital, mm -hmm. both by the mm -hmm. hospital personnel and the Portland police. And what we find the out... Portland police, are they the guards, if you will, or they did just call them up? Well, they had guards. They had nondescript guards. They're all in police uniforms, but no badges, no mm -hmm. uniform. They could have been federal officers. They could have been whatever. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing of it is is that they do this on a continuous basis, basically to poor people, to people they think are homeless, people who think are having mental issues, and people that they just don't want to treat. Well, it's in violation of federal law. And when we ask the people, the state, which is the Oregon Health Authority, what do you do about these cases? The enforcement's left with the state, but the state's not enforcing the law. When you look at the federal law, you have to go to the uh, 
Department of Health and the Inspector General. That's one way that you can actually file a complaint. Or you can file a civil suit, which I did, and I filed in federal court. But what we found out when you do civil rights in the state of Oregon is getting lawyers to represent you, whether you have money or not. In both cases, I had money, but couldn't get attorneys who said, well, you have great case, but we can't help you. Because the attorneys don't represent civil right cases for people of color in Oregon. Mm, mm. Unless you're dead. Mm. Now, if they kill you, they'll come in and they'll, they'll represent the family mm. because they know that's a, that's a winnable case for them. But in cases like this, oh, there's a question of this or there's a question of that. No. It's a clear case of violation of the federal law, medical abuse, and it was in 1983 we also filed, filed that, uh, which is the same as with uh, Rodney King, uh, police uh, brutality and abuse. So the police, you're, you're already in the hospital because you're ill. Uh, you're already physically uh, disabled. You're already in a diminished capacity. And then they brutalize you in the hospital. The police come along and brutalize you some more. They issue you a ticket for uh, trespass. And when they issue the, issue the ticket for trespass, then they say, if you come back, we'll arrest you. And if you're still capable of having any kind of civil protest, mm -hmm. then the police will arrest you and take you to jail. Well, they didn't take me to jail, but this is what they do to a lot of people. Some of the folks we were asking to come on the show, this happened to them. Mm -hmm. So from that point in time, I decided to file a civil litigation. And that's where we are right now in litigation. Well, tell me something. Now, you brought in another jurisdiction out of the city of Portland, right? Yes. You said Portland police was involved in this process, yes. right? Yes. Well, how did uh, the city of Portland, did they react to the issue? Did, were you able to tell your story? And then they... I tried to explain to I, who I was. I tried to identify myself. It was no case of that. The police just came. They didn't say anything much to me. They just picked me up and threw me to the ground. Mm -hmm. Just like they do all over the country. Mm -hmm. They choke you out. They shoot you. They throw you to the ground because that's basically their method of dealing with it. You're a problem. These good people have called you. And who, a hospital would never put a sick person out, so there must be something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. When they realized how sick I was, as even the police report, we can obviously see he was sick. Mm -hmm. He's obviously you can see that he was injured. We saw the tubes coming out of his body. But why did you brutalize me? Are they running on automatic or are they just stupid? Mm -hmm. Or just doing what they're told. Well, well, in fact, you make a good point there because when you start thinking about it, you know they're just doing the job. They, they've yeah. been given orders, if you will. They're following the orders. So in exactly. essence, you got to go up to the top, if you will, to the commanding officer, which in this particular case would be the mayor. Yes. To the mayor, city, city of Portland. Right. So the name of the game is that because because I, I don't buy this deal of trying to put it on police. I've got to go to the guy who's who's running the, the business because we, the public vote these people in to represent us. They write the rules and the regulations. That mm -hmm. means hopefully they, they get checked off because that's why we elect them. That's right. So they give the orders to the police. So my point is that where, what about yourself in your particular case? What about the administration? Were you able to maybe to maybe get that, that message over about your problems uh, to well, the I, chief officer, if you will, of the, the, of the city? Yeah, well, that's what you, that's what you uh, attempt to do. And that's what the mayor, unreachable, uh, I did have a good friend who worked for the city and was in charge of the police. What about the present mayor now? Was he involved in this? No, it wasn't that mayor. Charlie Hill. It what, wasn't Charlie what, Hill. What, what about now? Does he know about your? The, the well, yeah, but the case is in uh, civil litigation. What they do, the the mayor will put up buffers between him and and issues like that, and that's the city attorney. And the city attorney has a formula for dealing with these cases. So they say, oh, we can't talk to you because it's in litigation, and you have to go through the city attorney. But then still, still saying the same thing, you know. Yeah. We elect these folks. They may, they may appoint these folks, and i.e., lawyers and this, that, and that. But at the end of the day, you know, it's supposed to be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Absolutely. We elect that person. Right. They're supposed to respond, right. not throw it off on the side and blame somebody else with it. No, I'm not going to blame the city attorney. I'm, I'm blaming the mayor of the city of Portland. Right. Uh, well, fair. Yeah, that's fair. Um, well, Sam Adams was the mayor at the time. At the time. 2012. Yeah. So you, but you're uh, still stuck with the issue now. Yes. He's not in. He's yeah. not in that seat now. We no. have Charlie Hill. Charlie have you Hill. have you been able? To, does he know about your particular case? Sure, he does. He does know about your case. Yeah. How has he responded? Uh, we can't discuss it because it's in litigation. In litigation, but you're still hurting, trying oh. to figure out what to do. Well, yeah. <laughs> and poor folks can't react. Well, I'm laughing. Is, I'm laughing serious because it was me who was injured. But you understand, the mayor is also in charge. Is the the boss for the city attorney? He's the boss for the chief of police. Yes, I'm saying he's our representative, and he's the yes. boss of the city council. So right, right, the, right, the mayor's right. office is responsible. Their reaction right. is to try to shut me down. Yes, I hear you. They try to interfere with what I'm doing, and so they harass me on a continuous basis. Right, to right, right. Say, well, we're not going to have this, and we're not going to let you do this, and 
and this is the city of Portland, and no one's going to believe that the the hospital would do such a thing, and you know the police don't really kill citizens, and you know they don't brutalize anybody. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? I tell you what, Glenn. Now, now I'm giving you sort of an introduction to Oregon now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I didn't get back in terms of where you know where you were from, or you know, blah, blah blah, how long you've been here, this, that, and the other. Are you familiar with the issues? I just gave you some. I gave you two answers. And we talked about education. Now we're talking about health. A little response. How would you respond to some of those things that he was sharing with us just a minute ago? First, I think it is a uh, a shared story of reality and not something that uh, people of color uh, have not been exposed to over uh, the years. Mm -hmm. There's nothing is new. It's uh, how they um, uh, choose to handle the adversity that uh, happens and the negative uh, physical harm that come to people such, such as um, Gregory who endured these uh, civil rights violations. And so that's uh, first and foremost is what it was because um, these, uh, when your rights are violated to be uh, kept and cared for until at which time you can um, um, be transitioned into an environment mm -hmm. to continue that care and s something this egregious happens then it becomes a, a civil rights violation and um, to uh, deal with that uh, requires sometimes seeking uh, legal um, um, uh, um, intervention mm -hmm. uh, such as an attorney uh, to represent you a civil rights attorney attorney so this is where we come in as the National Action Network, mm -hmm. which is a social and civil rights organization okay. mm -hmm. uh, led and founded by Reverend Al Sharpton in 1991 mm -hmm. out of uh, New York City, uh, New York. And so what uh, he has done is made it possible for um, uh, other chapters to be set, out, set up throughout the nation, mm -hmm. whereas people that have suffered this sort of egregious um, uh, civil uh, violation can come and we can help uh, him address and um, uh, contact the, the powers that be mm -hmm. in order to um, find uh, solutions so that this doesn't happen not only to uh, him anymore but to others. And so this is what we do. We reach out and we search for good attorneys to recommend and we don't um, provide attorneys. But what we do is try to have a connection of list of attorney of attorneys that will represent the concerns of the that the individual is experiencing. Okay. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting, uh, and, then, and then that's one of the reasons I want to share with you also, too, just a little piece in regards to why you're here, in terms, and so you'll know who I am. Again, I happen to wear several hats around the state, <laughs> one of which happens to be the engagement chair. You know, this is going to be interesting. An engagement chair of the state of Oregon's Republican Party. Most cases familiar with, uh, in the past, it, it was always identified as the minority party, okay. the minority person. Okay. You got me? Yes. This is a new progressive way of saying engagement chair of all Oregonians. And yeah. I know that I know Reverend Sharp would also say he I mean, sure enough, he, he may have a ninety percent focus of black folks, but in all due respect, he, his doors is open for everybody. For everybody. For everybody. And I noticed that when he went with uh, McCain, yes. uh, Senator McCain, uh, went around dealing with the whole issue of education. You got who's a Republican? Yes. You got me? <laughs> and so my, my point is that the, the new Republican of Oregon is we're reaching out and engaged. That's my job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's yes. why you're here. One of the reasons why I yes. want to work very closely with you because Thank it's about you. issues across the board. Exactly. And then hopefully you can ask those Democrats the same word. Exactly. You know, what are you doing? Exactly. And, then put, and I want you to put the heat on me too. <laughs> yes. In terms of what are you going well, you, you made this statement, Drew, so let me know what's going on. So yes. that's why you're on the show and we're going to have you on the show on an ongoing basis. Thank you. And I want to publicly say to you, Point Blank, I want to join National Action Network. Thank can you. Can I do that? Yes, you okay, may. Fine. And I would, <laughs> you I would certainly hope can. I'd end it. So I, I'm saying, being that I represent the Oregon Republican Party as the engagement <laughs> Yes. Chair, we are now members of your organization. All right. Is that, right? <laughs> that is more than on? fair. Thank okay, you. Good enough. Thank we'll continue you. to talk about these issues. Is <laughs> that okay, Greg, with uh, you? That's fantastic. Okay, man. sounds great. Well, see, but get, get that, that's the point, though. See, the, the fact of the matter is we've got issues that, are, that we're believing with right now across the board. 
of all of us for that matter. Yes. And in Oregon, we got our own issues. So we're trying to figure out Oregon first. We're trying to solve some of our problems, like Greg. Yes. Yeah. And like you notice the education piece aspect of the largest school district in the state of Oregon. Yes. And it's still talking about the achievement gap, spending millions and millions of dollars. And we want to make it very clear to the new governor that's coming in. Exactly. Uh, Kate Brown, if you will. Hey, look here. Uh, we, we don't want to hear that stuff anymore. Exactly. In fact, that's why I'm going to be asking, since I'm going to be a member, I'm going to ask you, being the chairman, say, when are we going to have uh, Reverend Sharpton to come down to Portland, Oregon, to address this issue Absolutely. about the achievement gap, if you will. we got a serious, serious problem. And are you health issues like Greg? Got me? Yes. This, that, no. We need to get that. And that's for all all kids across exactly. the board. Well, Oregon is 49th in terms of graduating high school students. And when you look at Portland, you see that the high school students, high schools that have the highest achievement are, of course, Grant, uh, Wilson, and Lincoln. And at the bottom, of course, is Jefferson, Roosevelt. And you see those are disparaging because they're the you poor know, neighborhoods and the rich neighborhoods. And, and I rich, agree I the, agree with that, Greg, because children. I know for a fact you were in, in, in IE, the voc ed piece, because I, e, I know you're a computer technician. I mean, you right. were, and you were doing classes along that line, right. but it's not into the school system. Right. Right. You know, you come up this business with the charter school and stuff like that. Hey, I mean, the way the system was supposed to work mm -hmm. was that public schools was, was supposed to have the best schools, best education system in the world. Well, yes. actually, at I one point in time, and school. the whole idea, it was across the board. It wasn't, quote, a, a rich area, i.e. public school, that was getting a whole different ball game than a poor area, i.e. everybody gets the same thing, exactly. and a right. good voc ed. Right? Exactly. You hear all this business about the fact that uh, uh, technicians and i.e. Uh, 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 the trades and whatever, I mean, there's a, there's a big gap, if you will, for needs and whatever, and you would think right off the bat, you know, we could look at the community college from the standpoint of saying, okay, fine. And I think President Obama made that statement. I was kind of interesting about that because I've been saying the same thing. That's I think that it should be from K-1, well, uh, yeah, K-1 to the 14th. Yes. 14 yeah. years of education and include that other two years yes. as an associate degree. Exactly. You got me? Exactly. And then get the businesses and the unions or anybody else for that matter with trades to come in and get their resources from there. Exactly. And that would help out with all this issue about getting folks, these young people especially, uh, uh, listing them as gang members. Exactly. There's, there's no such thing as gang members. I was a right. gang member myself <laughs> in the Marine Corps. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. absolutely. Anyway, I just, want, I just yes. thought that throw that out to you. But before we get into a little bit more, you know, I, I didn't give you enough chance and not to kind of get a sense of what about your background? How long have you been in the Portland metropolitan area in the well, state of Oregon? Well, I moved to Portland 1995. Okay. Um, and and um, as a, um, a national certified medical assistant, mm -hmm. which is how I earned my living. So I continued to work as a medical assistant during that time, and uh, which is where um, it just, uh, it's difficult to explain yeah, sometimes no because uh, how did I arrive here? Well, I was born on a plantation in Blyseville, Arkansas. And that is where I experienced the firsthand segregation. Mm -hmm. So I often share with people, I've not had to read a book. Mm -hmm. I've not had to watch a movie. Mm -hmm. I evolved from uh, that um, awful environment. And it's an environment that uh, I think our um, leaders, our white leaders, mm -hmm. must acknowledge mm -hmm. and they must admit and they must apologize and be so that we can begin to heal the race of people that were oppressed and suppressed. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, I say that I've been on my way uh, since conception and today I have finally arrived. Great, 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 great. Because great. I think that uh, health care is a... Um, uh, development area where it begins at conception mm -hmm. and it extends through death. So as such, uh, it uh, impacts uh, our environment, whereas we have to attribute our poor quality of health care to um, the uh, root causes. And for me, root causes began when the U.S. Constitution was first developed mm -hmm. because the um, leaving uh, s nations of people out of the provisions in order to perform has created this um, um, 
con the, the condition of inequality mm -hmm. and health inequity. And so looking back on that and trying to put all of these concerns into uh, into a sort of uh, plan where we can learn and uh, how to uh, uh, fix the wrong that mm -hmm. was done. It's, it's going to take uh, all of us uh, to uh, uh, in, be willing to change the way we think the way we behave. Mm -hmm. So uh, from an educational standpoint, I think which is a huge because that is first going to um, start putting together the pieces because to make it simple, I would say that um, when we're being educated, it's about people mm -hmm. that deal with humanity. It's about mm -hmm. the process and the steps that are taken and practices that uh, is uh, and how these practices are used mm -hmm. and uh, the progress that we the progress that we make uh, that um, uh, reflects the outcomes the outcomes being uh, how has uh, these proposals these I identifications these um, um, uh, in these uh, areas where it causes hardship on people of color, how do we fix it? And um, my thinking is, I believe that the uh, the change of that we seek is going to be in the um, uh, 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 I often say that the, the change that we seek uh, is the change must be in leadership. And that just does not mean changing the, um, the ethnicity of who are, who's leading us, but it means changing our attitudes, changing our practices to um, uh, get to a point where we can identify uh, the uh, issues that the racial divide, the social determinants of health, uh, meaning um, homelessness mm -hmm. and uh, stirred in one area of, uh, you know, it's, uh, of, of, of a community because of your ethnicity. And I know we think we are beyond that, mm -hmm. but uh, I do not think yeah, that sure. we are, yes. And I think too that given the statistics that are out here, and I'm not a numbers person, because I know that uh, people of color, black Americans, <sighs> outnumber our counter uh, parts mm -hmm. uh, at all levels in society, whether it's education, housing, economic development, and uh, the only thing that we excel in, the only sector we excel in, is uh, death outcomes. Okay, okay. Well, you know, uh, folks, again, I wanted to give her an opportunity to articulate. As you can see, she's a very articulate person. She's been around. And in fact, uh, we were sort of neighbors over there when in front where you were born in your area, you see. I may have been a little younger than you. Well, see, I picked cotton when I was yes. from Louisiana. Did you pick a little cotton? <laughs> I when you, picked, I you chopped, picked I pulled. And I chopped, well, I did the same <laughs> thing. You, you probably was on that other road. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Not very far. <laughs> well, you know, uh, and, and I'm sure you can, you can relate to that, and sure, I'm sure that um, uh, Neighborhood Bill can, too. Oh, yeah, you know, my parents are from Arkansas, his, too. And they, they, too, picked cotton. I, yes. I, I, knew, I knew his dad real well. Yeah. And the bottom line is that I think one of the problems we've had, we, we, we're still, we were still fighting, if you will, the Civil War, the North and yes. the South, okay? And I think one of the reasons why we're doing that is that we've never, we've not educated, if you will, uh, the people as a whole exactly. as to the history, 
if you will, of, of us. You know, right. for instance, right. when Lincoln came up, he tried to, but yes. then they shot him. Yes. Now, had he lived, I think we wouldn't be having this, this conversation <laughs> right now. See, because yes. they've left that history out of the education system. Yes. You, you can't, as the old saying goes, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You <laughs> exactly. So you got to educate the kids. Right. So it needs to be in the school system. So therefore, it recognizes all of us because we're all immigrants. Exactly. We're all immigrants. Exactly. In fact, in most cases, the, the African American, all black folks, you know, because yes. they went from African American. We're black folks now. Yes. We're the one that built this country. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. But the fact of the matter is, you know, that you can't expect the majority, because if I'm a majority, I don't want to hear that stuff. Right. I'm exactly. just going to deal on my own. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do, we just need to go back in the educational system and educate folks, because you, we can't really tell the person where to go if you don't know where you came from. Exactly. Is that fair? You exactly. Got so we need to educate the masses as a whole. Fair? Yeah. That, that's what, fair. One Good of on. the things you were talking about education is, is, uh, is the technical aspect of it, which is STEM, which is the big emphasis now, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. And we've been teaching STEM in this Portland area, the black educators, since the uh, early 80s. Okay. Under McKinley Burt. Okay. It started with OMSI and then it expanded into different things. This is what I did for the Portland Public Schools. Mm -hmm. And each school that we implemented. So you were working with Portland Public Schools at one point in time? Oh, yeah. Was it successful during that particular era? I was successful in my program, which yeah. was part of the, the strut program. Well, you brought up another issue. Now, you say your program. <laughs> what about the rest of them? Oh, no, they failed. They, were, <laughs> they, they failed miserably. And the reason that it failed miserably, every school I worked at had a very successful track record. I first started with Portland Public Schools at Humboldt School. Mm -hmm. I got to Humboldt Schools, one of the worst schools in the entire school district. After three years, it was one of the uh, most progressive. As a matter of fact, the, pr the principal won a national award, the Millican Award, for the best principle for the development of the technology and the art that was part of the piece that we put together. When I got there, they had three computers at, uh, at Humboldt that were on the internet. And when I got there, because of my experience mm -hmm. working in the corporate world, the entire school was networked. All the children uh, were uh, progressing because of the way that uh, Judy Bryan introduced the, the use of the computer technology into the classroom. So all the classrooms had computers, but they're not functioning. The teachers weren't utilizing the software like every school building I went into. I would always find computer equipment, technological equipment that went obsolete in the box. Software never used because the teachers were, were good at writing grants, but they weren't trained in how to use these well, types great. of things. I'm gonna cut you up, but I'm going to make this point, and that's the point I'm making. The voc ed. He was yes. doing voc ed hands-on. Yes. Because rich yeah. kids, you know, the, the parents have, you will take them to their various jobs and get them on their jobs. They can be articulate. A lot of these kids, and I'm not talking about old black folks. You right. Know what I'm but the fact of the matter is the majority of the kids that we're talking and blaming, if yes. you will, yes. the gang and this, that, and the other, you got to give them something with a hands-on deal. You know, taking an automobile and saying, okay, fine, I, we're, we're going to go on and rebuild this engine. Exactly. I mean, you got you got math there. You got you got you got to be in the read, write, and you know what I'm saying. Exactly. So so that's a major piece. That's why he was successful because the kids that he was dealing with, they loved it because they had something to do. They could relate to it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, and I and I got to make that point because I remember I interviewed Vera Katz. She was right. mayor. And Vera was the one that basically introduced this, her, her and Norma Paulus, mm -hmm. who was Secretary of State, introduced this idea, well, we want to, everybody needs to go to college. Yes. You know, but, but there was going to be a balance, if you will. But the balance never happened. You know, now it's called, if you don't have a degree, you're nothing. Absolutely. And that's a sad, sad note. Don't get me wrong. I mean, education is very important. When we come up, at this age right now, I mean, trying to relate to the, to the education class today <laughs> would be very difficult, if you hear what I'm saying. Yes. And I'm yes. not trying to say that, you know, we're, we're not as sharp. But, but we're seeing, I came up from a voc ed kind of a situation. Yes. Well, see, that's what STEM is. STEM is the technologically, technically. Yeah, but where's STEM yeah, today? Do we have it today? Yeah, yeah. There's, there, there's STEM is being... Uh, promoted all over the country. Now. No, no, I'm That's talking about Portland. 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 Yeah, it's being Portland promoted public in, schools. It's being promoted in the Portland public schools. Yes, it is. And there's a... Uh, Auto mechanics and all that other good stuff? No. Well, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking mm -hmm. about an overall. Everybody's not so, see, technically in time. Yeah, exactly. STEM uh, deals more with the, 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 the technological aspects of computer technology and, and the state-of-the-art technology, but you're right. They need to have a, a, a holistic perspective yeah. of it. And I was just trying to say... With Home X, all that kind of well, stuff. It, it needs Carpentry? To be holistic. What we did and we found was successful teaching children of color, actually all children, and we used a multicultural, interdisciplinary approach okay, okay. with the applied methodology. Okay. What that means is, just what it says, it's multicultural, it, from the perspective of your culture, my culture, whatever, you introduce knowledge and education. You also deal with the uh, interdisciplinary approach, because you can teach a math lesson while you're teaching a, uh, a, a reading lesson.
you can teach uh, home economic you can have a home economics class and turn it into a math lesson or a social studies lesson or a political science lesson you can also make it an applied methodology because the children get instant gratification because they learn how to do it. But Greg, why, why, why aren't you there now? What are you? Why, why, <laughs> why did you get out of that deal? Well, well you know, I got moved out of the Portland Public School. Moved schools. out? Yeah, okay, I got, yeah, okay, I got so fired it, at the Portland Public Schools, uh -huh. but then I went to work for Victory Middle School, okay. which was a charter school, and Victory uh, Middle School and Albany Youth Opportunity School, which right. is the alternative yep. high school. Yep. Yeah, I worked on all those, and we they, don't they have were successful. Anymore. Well, let's say all these throwaway kids you talked about, well, we, when they got in this proper environment with a, a proper type of education, yeah, they on. academically outperformed the sure, students sure. at the Portland Public yeah, Schools. Right. And then the Portland Public Schools was in charge of the charter schools. They said, well, Victory, well, you're doing too good, so we have to shut you down. So all the schools that we worked at that were successful were closed. That's what I'm trying to say. Every educational program that sits outside of the system that effectively helped black children into this new uh, standard where the teachers have to be uh, evaluated by their, uh, good, uh, how well good. they do, okay. uh, they were shut down because it made the standard system look bad. Okay. See, what you have is you have a lot of the has a rigidity in the educational system. So teachers are in charge of things which they have no understanding of. Let me put it to you like this. Someone said the best teachers are kept from teaching. Right now, Einstein couldn't teach math in the Portland Public Schools because he doesn't have a teaching certification. All right? Okay. All right. All right. Well, look, I tell you what, we got about another three or four minutes, and I'm sure yeah. people here are anxious to kind of get a little feel for what is uh, the National Action Network. So we're going to spend a little time with you, kind because of, I know that you you were you were uh, you were back there. You've gone to some of the, the association meetings and things of that nature, and just kind of educate the public a little bit about uh, about what is National Action Network. How did you get involved in it, and and uh, what what do you get out of it? And you know, just just spend a little time. We got about another two minutes or so. Why don't you just give us two minutes with? You? Well, I first uh, just got back into, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the political community outreach um, activism work when uh, I uh, realized that President Obama was more than just someone seeking a position to the highest office. He was someone whom I felt had um, a, a uh, special quality and so realizing after listening to his um, the things that he wanted to do and things that he wanted to achieve then I said okay this is where what has been bothering me um, I wanted to be able to contribute to that and help him get elected because his um, message resonated with me because I've always thought is uh, what the, 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 his, 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 his issues that he wanted to champion mm -hmm. were issues that were near and dear to my heart. So I started with um, uh, going door to door campaigning for him for his uh, initial election. And then I discovered that uh, Reverend L had a chapter in the state of Oregon. So at that time, someone else was the president, and I joined there. And so after that came to an end, that particular chapter ended, then I implemented uh, the, uh, another chapter, and this is the chapter that now exists. Mm -hmm. And so because of what Reverend Al has stood for all these years, and I've been keeping up with him for uh, several years. I got it. I got it. And uh, um, I uh, realized that there was a, a, a need in this area for someone to speak uh, truth to power about what it is a nation of people, black African Americans suffer in our in these okay. United States. All right, well, I'll tell you what, we're gonna, we, uh, Glendora Claybrooks, right? Yes. Glendora, Glendora Claybrooks, we're gonna have you back on, I think it's very, very important. And by the way, it's nothing wrong with saying the role model, right? He is the, he was a role model yes. and excited a lot of black folks, okay? Yes, yes. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Right. And so we're gonna move forward, but the fact is we're at the table, right? Yes. Right. And so now we have to carry the ball now. Yes. Clean up our neighborhoods. And, and take the ball.